prefer your true crime in podcast form? Want to listen on your favorite podcast platform? This episode was also uploaded as a podcast episode. This episode is not intended for children. No harm is intended to the victims described in this episode or their families. This episode is intended for educational purposes. Content warnings. This episode covers heavy subject matter and includes serious content warnings, including sexual assault, including that of a child, sexual assault that includes anal activity, incest, domestic violence and abuse, child abuse and neglect, strangulation, mentions of Nazi symbols and white supremacist groups, heavy drug use. Please, if any of the previous are a trigger for you, come back for another episode. Unfortunately, there's never any shortage of true crime. Hi everyone! If you're here from last episode, welcome back, and thank you so much. If you're new, I'm Lee Nix, and this is my podcast, A Memory of Malice. The memory I have for you today is, well, it's not a pleasant one. I'm not gonna lie. I did wonder about trying to keep the perpetrators, in this case, uh, some kind of big secret and do a big reveal, but decided that's gimmicky and I wasn't going to do that to you. The case I'm covering today is the murder spree of James Gregory Marlowe and Cynthia Lynn Kaufman. I'm covering all three of their murders. And some of you may Google this case and see five listed elsewhere, but I'll cover that misconception in episode three. Right, this episode is going to be a two-parter. There's lots to cover, too much, I think, to jam into a single episode. So I'll be splitting this case into two, and keep in mind that the content warnings cover both episodes. I did that because I didn't want someone to become interested in the first episode and realize there was something that they couldn't handle in the second episode. So I put all the content warnings in both episodes. This case is rough, but it's also very bizarre. It starts with a meet-cute between a white supremacist and an ex-Catholic schoolgirl, an ass tattoo that somehow becomes court evidence, a hit taken out by a Kentucky biker, and ends up in what almost became a set of serial killings. Or was it almost? Also, my most informative source was the book Property of the Folsom Wolf by Don Lasseter, and it changed the names of some of the people in this case. I think I found the real names for most of them, but if I do get it wrong, I'm very sorry. Another really good source for this case was the LA Times, who keeps their archives on their webpage. Alright, I think that's enough pre-case things. Let's go! I really thought about the best way to tell this, and I figured that this way is probably the most sympathetic to the actual individuals who deserve sympathy in this story, the victims and their families. So I'll focus on them first. When Gregory Wildman Hill's body was found rotting in the Kentucky sun in July 1986, it wasn't so much a question of who was a suspect as who wasn't. Wildman was a biker, a heavy drug user, and he had recently agreed to testify against another biker in the area. There was no shortage of people who would want him dead. It was obvious he had been there at least a day or two by the insect activity on and around the body. It wasn't an optimistic situation for investigators hoping to find any clues. The locals made an arrest or two, but ultimately there were no clues and no leads, and the case went cold almost immediately. The troopers had no idea that events that would happen more than 2,000 miles away would solve this murder without them having to do a thing. In Redlands, California, a smart, hard-working girl named Karina Novis hadn't shown up for work. For most of us, this might not mean much, but Novis's boss knew that this was completely out of character for her. So on November 10th, 1986, her boss stood outside the duplex where her employee lived, concerned that she had had some sort of accident. First, she noticed that Karina's car, a white Honda CRX, wasn't there. 
The car was brand new and had been a gift from Karina's father when he found out she was getting around the city on a moped. The absence of the car didn't necessarily mean that something bad had happened. Maybe Karina had taken the car out herself. But something still didn't feel right to her boss. I expect that her unease only increased when she realized Karina's door was standing partly open. I can't think of a good reason someone would leave their front door open when they were away from home, and I'm sure she couldn't either. I'm not sure about California, but in Arizona we have like these security screen doors that have good sturdy locks on them so you can keep the doors open and save money on your electricity bill. (laughs) But you don't leave them open, your door open and your screen door closed when you're away. and. When her boss tried the screen door, it was unlocked, and she could just go inside. And she found herself inside of a dark, hot, empty apartment. The apartment had been turned over. Every nook and cranny had been explored, every drawer emptied in search of hidden treasure. When she looked in the bathroom, all of Karina's personal things and toiletries that she'd need were still there. Anxiety quickly turned to dread, and Karina's boss called the police. Karina Novis was one of those people who seemed to be going places. A lover of animals, a hard worker, a cheerleader, a brilliant student. There was very little that Karina couldn't do if she put her mind to it. On top of all that, she was just a genuinely kind person, described as someone who seemed to light up every room she went into. She grew up in the tiny town of Fairfield, Idaho to a pair of loving parents. She was the middle child, sandwiched between her elder sister, Brenda Lee, and her younger brother, Bill Jr. But there didn't seem to be any middle child dramatics for her. Instead, she focused her energy on always doing something. When Karina decided she wanted to be a cheerleader, she worked hard at it. She practiced as much as she could, and even attended a cheerleading camp. When she finally entered high school, it was only natural for her to be part of the team. But being on the cheer team didn't mean she slacked on her other activities. She somehow found time to be on the track team and competed in championships for four years straight. All this while holding a variety of part-time jobs. Despite doing everything under the sun, Karina graduated from high school with a 3.1 GPA and enrolled at CSI or the College of Southern Idaho. They had a medical office procedures program that takes about a year and a half to complete. Karina completed the track in a year, and that surprised absolutely no one, I'm sure. It was during this time that something happened that Karina didn't plan for. She fell in love. Mike McFadden had been a recurring face during Karina's high school years, and they had been friends high school, he had left to go to a different state to play football in university, while she stayed home. In 1984, during a Thanksgiving break in which Mike had returned home from California's distant shores, Karina and Mike met again, and something happened. Sparks flew as they spent time together, and after he'd returned home, they began a long-distance relationship. The book described them going on a date on Valentine's Day and deciding to go steady. It was really kind of cute. That summer, they spent every free moment together, and only fell deeper in love. And when the fall came, Mike had to return to California. They had come to a crossroads in their relationship, and a decision had to be made. Karina decided to visit Mike in Redlands, California, for five weeks. Even during this short span, Karina managed to find employment. What can I say? She's a hard worker. But the couple loved spending their free time together, and so, upon returning home, Karina decided to move to Redlands with Mike permanently. She moved in with Mike and found a job with a state farm insurance agency. It was only part-time at first, but it promised to be full-time soon. In the meantime, she scooped ice cream part-time to make up the difference, and even when her job went full-time, she would later pick up shifts at the ice cream shop to help out, which is just so sweet. At some point, Mike decided he wasn't comfortable having such a serious relationship as young as he was, 
and they both agreed to call it quits. Karina was heartbroken, but she was responsible. And so she moved out, she moved into a duplex of her own nearby, and bought a little moped that had a little basket on front to carry all of her things. At one point, her sister Brenda visited her. It was nice, and she was still a little heartbroken over Mike. And she promised to come visit her family, and she kept her promise. It was then that her father bought her the white Honda CRX. It seemed as if Karina was a responsible girl who had really settled into her new home in Redlands. How does a 20-year-old girl just vanish? Where did she go? And what had happened in her apartment? Everyone who knew Karina was worried. She had made plans to meet a cousin on November 7th, and she had never shown. She had made an appointment with a manicurist friend of hers to do her nails, and she hadn't turned up. She had never come to the frat party she had been getting ready for all that evening. Karina had vanished. All of Karina's friends got together and began putting up missing posters in a desperate effort to find their friend. They had no idea that it was already far too late. A KFC worker was beginning his shift at 9.30 a.m. on November 11th when he found a Taco Bell bag by the dumpster out back. This, in and of itself, wasn't too strange. The Huntington Beach KFC was right next to a Taco Bell, so it wouldn't be too weird if some stray trash had blown its way towards the wrong franchise. He reached down to throw the bag in the dumpster, and he noticed that several cards were spilling out of the bag. The cards appeared to be ID cards. Worried that the items were potentially important to someone, the employee called the manager of the Taco Bell and turned the items over to him. The manager opened the bag inside his office, finding a driver's license, an ID card, and a California Department of Corrections card, all with different names and photos on them. There was also a red checkbook with checks inside. One of the checks had several signatures on it that appeared similar to the signature on the driver's license. The manager made the assumption that something was going on and called the police. When the Redlands police received word that Corinna's driver's license and checkbook had been found in the trash, it was ominous news. That news was only compounded by the information that the California Department of Corrections card belonged to one James Gregory Marlowe, a career felon with ties to the Aryan Brotherhood, and a history of heavy drug use. The ID card was a bit of a mystery to the police. Cynthia Kaufman had a warrant out for her arrest for failure to appear in court, but other than that, there were only minor arrests in her background. Could it be possible that she was also abducted by Marlowe? Were they looking for two missing women now? Taking no chances, the police put out a bolo on Kaufman and Marlowe and decided to track down Marlowe's half-sister, Veronica Coppers, for a chat. Linnell Murray was a bright, empathetic girl with everything in life going for her. She had a loving family, a great relationship with her boyfriend, and a passion for helping everyone she met. She may not have done as much as Karina quite yet, but at 19, she was certainly making her mark. The daughter of two parents who had divorced, Linnell nevertheless had a close relationship with her mother and father. At one point, there had been some friction between Linnell and her mother and she had temporarily gone to live with her father, but she moved back in with her mother when she realized how much she missed living with her and her sister. Linnell had three younger sisters, Stacy, who was her full sister, and Holly and Aaron, who were her half-sisters from her father's remarriage. The siblings adored each other, and altogether they were a pretty well-adjusted bunch. Impressively, when Linnell was in high school, she and another student worked with the school to create a place where students could go to talk about their problems, serious problems like drugs or sex or other problems similar to those. This other student was named Rob, and gradually he and Linnell fell for each other. So, when Linnell was late for a date on November 12, 1986, Rob immediately felt like something was wrong. It just wasn't like her to be late. He and Linnell had made plans to meet at the condo where she, 
her mother, and her sister Stacy lived, so he didn't have to go far to ask for assistance. Stacy knew Linnell was working at the dry cleaners that evening, and she also knew that sometimes pushy people came in right at closing and could make you close late. So although Linnell was rarely late, she wasn't worried about it. But Rob knew something was wrong. Rob is a great boyfriend, like 10 out of 10. So he decided to head out to Prime Cleaners and check things out. When he reached the parking lot, his fears only increased. Though the lights of Prime Cleaners were off and the sign on the door flipped to closed, Linnell's car was still in the parking lot. He called Linnell's home and reached Stacy, and he asked her again if her sister had come home yet. And she was now frightened as well, and she told him no, she hadn't come home. And when she hung up with him, she called her mom, who was working at a restaurant that night, and her mom immediately knew something was wrong as well and left work to go look for her daughter. By this time, Rob had not only called the Huntington Beach Police Department to report his suspicions, he'd also called the owner of the cleaners. That man arrived with his keys because he was worried about Linnell too. And when they turned on the lights, it was obvious that the business had been robbed. The cash drawer was wide open, the clothes racks were all in disarray, and Linnell's books were wide open on the counter, and they both knew she wouldn't have left them. The owner immediately called the police to report that his business had been robbed and that Linnell had likely been abducted. Police processed the scene at Prime Cleaners, collecting whatever evidence they could in the hope that they could find Linnell Murray, but there wasn't much that could be done. They had a helicopter in the sky looking for anything suspicious, and they put out a notice to everyone in the department to keep an eye out for her. But they were hampered by the lack of technology available to them in 1986. If this disappearance happened today, Linnell would probably have been found in an hour. But... Unfortunately, it didn't. Meanwhile, back in Redlands, police had managed to track down James Gregory Marlowe's half-sister, Veronica Coppers. When they led her into an interrogation room on the morning of November 13th, they weren't sure what they were going to hear. They knew Marlowe had some kind of connection to Karina Novis. But what about this Cynthia Kaufman? So, when Veronica told them that Cynthia Kaufman, who had been introduced to her as sinful, was her brother Greg's girlfriend, they were probably a bit surprised. Could Kaufman be Marlowe's accomplice in all this? If so, what had they done to Karina Novis? It was when they asked Veronica about Karina Novis that they received their most shocking answer yet. Nancy had spent an anxious night worrying about her eldest child, and I imagine when the phone rang, she must have felt so full of hope for a moment. Hope can be an awful thing. Instead of her daughter on the line, a representative from Bank of America was calling her. Unaware of the trauma going on in the life of the woman she was talking to, she asked Nancy if the woman trying to use Linnell's bank card had authorization to do so. Nancy quickly asked for a description of the woman, and was told, Oh, she's medium height, thin, and has very short, dark hair. For a split second, Nancy wondered why her daughter's kidnappers had cut her hair. But she took hold of herself, and told the representative to call the authorities. As soon as she had hung up, Nancy herself called the Huntington Beach Police. Someone was using her daughter's credit card and it wasn't her daughter. A scream rang out inside the Huntington Inn at approximately 3.35. Staff ran to room 307. One staff member walked into the bathroom and flipped on the light and was treated to a grisly scene. When he entered that bathroom, he saw the body of a young woman draped over the edge of the tub her legs over the toilet. She was very obviously dead, and violently so. Linnell Murray had been found. 
Huntington Beach detectives had arrived at a violent crime scene. One bed had been stripped of its blankets, presumably by housekeeping, and sheets covered in blood lie underneath. The other bed lay mostly untouched, though the blankets had been pulled down and its pillow was naked, missing its pillowcase. Inside the bathroom, things became more tragic. Linnell lay sprawled across the toilet and the tub, her head submerged in cloudy, bloody water, though she hadn't been drowned in it. It was found that she had been strangled by the strips of torn wet towel found liberally around the bathroom. In fact, one strip was still around her throat when they lifted her head out of the water, and though it wasn't tied. It wasn't the only strip on her body. She had several strips gagging her, and another tying her right arm to her waist. Her left arm was found wrenched behind her back. In a crime scene that is so violent and so horrifying, it would be easy to miss the small details. Fortunately, the criminalist on scene managed to notice what might be an inconsequential detail. In one of Linnell's ears was a unique leaf-shaped earring, but in the other ear there was no matching earring. While searching the mostly untouched bed, near where the blankets had been pulled down, an earring back was found, and it matched the back of the leaf earring. An earring back was found, but no earring. It was late in the evening before Huntington Beach Detective Richard Hooper received a phone call that two people up near Big Bear had repeatedly attempted to use Linnell Murray's credit card. Unfortunately, they had fled into the woods, and the only thing they could do was blockade the three roads in and out of the area and wait. At 9.30 that evening, Huntington Beach police detectives had to inform Nancy Murray of her daughter's death. When she saw them, she had the faint hope they were bringing her baby home. But instead, she was given her daughter's ring, the one she had been wearing the night of her disappearance. A scream rang out in the Murray home, and the grieving mother fainted, falling into the arms of her ex-husband. The next bit is going to feel like mood whiplash, and I don't know what to tell you. I did warn you this case was bizarre. The next afternoon, two San Bernardino Sheriff's officers were driving along Highway 38 when they saw a rather odd sight. They had been told to look out for a man with a long mustache and a woman with very short hair. But what they saw... Well, if the suspects had been trying to be inconspicuous, they had failed. The man was wearing swimming trunks paired with a dress shirt and chunky biker boots. The woman was wearing a bikini, a sweater on top of the bikini, and high heels. They looked like they pressed that random outfit button and created a sim. It was just very weird. So the sheriff's deputies immediately pulled over. And another sheriff's office car that had been following them not very far behind, they saw them too and they did one of those UEs that I imagine is like in a cartoon where it's on two wheels and they just hurry around. Um... <laughs> And everyone's got their guns pulled, and so it was a pretty easy arrest altogether. The only struggle there was was when somebody tried to take Cynthia Kaufman's enormous black bag from her. And she argued that she needed it. She needed it, don't you know? And the trooper arresting her was like, you're going to jail. You don't need anything. And he wrested it away from her while she was hustled into the back of a squad car. And he looked inside of that bag and saw the handle of a handgun. Which might be important later and it might not, I don't know. So, who were Marlo and Kaufman? How did they get Linnell Murray's credit card? How did their ID end up with Karina Novus's near a KFC trash can? Did they kill Linnell Murray? And just where was Karina Novus? How does this all relate back to Wildman Hill? And what about the ass tattoo I was talking about in the beginning? Well, I'm out of time for this episode, but I'll tell you all in episode 3, part 2 of Marlowe and Kaufman.
If you have a case you want me to do an episode on, or you notice I said something that was incorrect, email me at amemoryofmalice at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. All of you are the best, and you truly make my day. If you liked this episode, please like, rate, review, subscribe, whatever the deal is for your platform. If you'd like to follow me on my socials, I'm at a memory of malice on Twitter, and I'm still in a feud with Facebook over an Instagram account because apparently I'm just not allowed to have one. If that changes, I'll make sure to update my Twitter. Links will be in the details. I love you all, and remember to stay safe and stay hydrated. Thank you.